Boom. All right. Yo, it's Sunday. Um, happy to live another day, this crazy 2021 now. Hopefully things get better, and they will. They will with us, you know, the Real City Ambassadors from the Bay. Uh, this next person, I've been, you know, just kind of looking at his trajectory. I've been following him. I've been laughing with him by the things he says, by the things he does, um, both online and, and, and back in the day when we'd, we'd get together. He's a, a storyteller first and foremost. He's born and raised in the city, San Francisco. You know, he's best known for his, his adventurous lifestyle and like the radio. So he works at like KMEL. He's a uh, part of iHeartMedia. You know, he's also an activist in his own right. But even before that, you'd see him a lot of times in the comedy scene, whether it be the Punchline San Francisco, Cops Comedy Club. He does improv. I mean, the question I'm going to ask him, what does he not do? So without further ado, can I give you all the one and only Larry Dorsey Jr. Hey, yo. What's, what's up, up with it, man? <laughs> My fellow Low Light. Damn, hey, we're going to get to that real quick because I think we got to do a public service announcement about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean we'll, we'll, we'll get to that when we get there. But just, you know, introduce yourself. How do you, you let folks know who Larry Dorsey Jr. is? Well, my name is the same as a social media handle. Um, I believe in Pan-Africanism and reparations and land back for Native Americans was cracking. <laughs> hey, yo, bro. And, um, you know, I know that you say that your activism kind of started uh, in maybe a few years ago. But were you, did you grow up kind of in a household where you were receiving this type of messaging or learning about your histories? No. No, 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 no. No. no let's start no. there. Let me start no. you off real quick with this photo. And um, give me a second. <laughs> I'm gonna share this one right here. Let's start. Let's start here. Oh damn! Okay. Let's start here. That's over there in Lakeview. That's at the church um, on Garfield. That's my brother and I, and that's where my dad actually had his first own personal martial arts dojo at okay. the church. It's really? Like, at a inside of a church? Yeah, there was hella different rooms at the time. It was like. From what I remember, it was primarily black, but it could have changed by now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, we used to, my dad used to take us there all the time. We used to train all the time <laughs> at that age and everything. And, you know, I think it, it it got us a lot of confidence. My dad put us in every type of sport. You know what I mean? Really? My dad actually played in the NFL and played like, was like an all-American, like, in like basketball and all types of different sports. Mm, but, mm -hmm. but he had me and my brother, he was like, you know, I don't want you to get bullied. I don't want you to have problems growing up in this kind of city. Cause he grew up in the woods. Like he grew up Where? in the country, he, he's from Texas. Okay. Yeah. And so for him, he didn't want us to go through things, you know what I mean? And he was all like, y'all is light skin. You know what I mean? Like y'all gonna have to go cause he ain't light skin, you know? Yeah. Okay. So, so tell me, wait, wait, break that down for me or break it down for folks that maybe are not. In the know, what, is, what does that mean? I don't know. Well, first of all, there's colorism, right? So I have mm -hmm. a privilege as someone who's lighter skin and, and black, right? You mm -hmm. know, I'm half, but I'm lighter skin and I'm black. So I have a privilege that a lot of darker skin black people don't have. And mm -hmm. there's racism, like in, in any culture around the world, anywhere in any country, the darker you have your skin, you get discriminated against. You have less opportunities and stuff. Mm -hmm. And all... We'll go, for no, it. go, 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 go. I was going to say, so also what my dad was, what he was referring to is that, you know, sometimes lighter skinned people will look softer, right? And could mm -hmm. get taken advantage of when it comes to like street stuff, right? So he yeah. wanted us to be prepared for the wolves of the hardcore growing up in the city in the concrete jungle. You feel what I'm I saying? Hear you. And then you said, so you said half and your other half is... Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> I ain't <laughs> yeah, I ain't yeah, my mom's uh, uh, a little bean, you know, she's Colombian uh -huh. and she's a little, doo -doo 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 -doo. so she's, uh, <laughs> I love her, you know, so half my family is, looks like you and the other uh -huh. half looks like uh, Denzel Washington. <laughs> 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 Yo, what was it like for you to grow up like kind of with two identities? And you said your mom 
born and raised in Colombia, moved here. Yeah. So she's Spanish speaking, native, immigrant. Your folk, your, fo your dad has roots in the South, moved yeah. over here. What was that like for you growing up? Middle school, what middle school did you go to and what elementary? I went to Lakeshore. Okay. It was kind of like a hippie school. It's like right next to, it's actually right next to Lowell. And then I went to- uh, Oh, yeah, 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 I know that. School. Yeah, literally right next to Lowell, right? Yeah. And then I went yeah. to Aptis. And that was like, that was a, a crazy so experience. Lakeshore SF. Yeah. That's it right there. Yeah. One right next to that's so wait, what was that like? You said it was like a hippie school. Tell yeah. me what that means. Because hippie love, means different things for every San Franciscan. Yeah, peace and unity and we're all equal and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. It was a cool experience. It's a good education, everything, you know. It was it was it was a great I, I would say Lakeshore was dope. Aptis was was amazing too, but the difference was Aptis was like when I went there was hood. Yeah, like, it was like going to juvenile hall. Like it was like the first, like people had guns and knives, and there was fights every day. Aptis, bro. And I went to Horace Man, so I'm like, all right, if you tell me Horace Man, Everett, but Aptis, yeah, really? for sure. Okay. What okay. Aptis okay. was good back. Then. All right, okay, bro. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was crazy, and it was you know majority Latino and black when I went there. And we had a couple mm. Polynesians, you know, a couple mm. Filipinos here, a couple, you know, sprinkled over there. But that's that was my memory of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, it taught me a lot about life. You know, like when I like like one of my friends, he was murdered when we were like in sixth grade, 10 years old. He got shot in a drive by. And oh. it was like kind of like that was like the start of me kind of understanding what it means to be black or even Latino. Right. You yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. Like the life that we live where, and you know, when I say Latino, a lot of times I interchange it with Native American, you know what I mean? Because mm, the indigenous Why? roots of being Latino a lot of times is like, if you look at you, if someone looks at you, they're going to be like, this guy, where is he from? He's from the Americas. He's right. his, his ancestors are from the Americas as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, so, I know exactly what you mean. So, so for me, like as in a Native American person or a black person, like we have so many crazy things that happen to us and and still the healing has yet to come. And so, but at, when I was young, I went through a phase where I was like, I thought that's what it was. Like being mm -hmm. hood, trying to like be gangster, trying to do all those things. I went well, through all those processes and I yeah, thought man. that's what it was supposed to be. And one day I kind of like went on a journey of consciousness to try to, like you said, when I got into activism, I got in probably like 2013, something like that is when I started getting my, my, like, my wokeness, you feel me? Yeah, yeah, but what about during this time right here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I lol, you know what's crazy? So I was always the class clown, right? Mm. That's how I got, like people say like my talent is writing, like poetry or like lyrical kind of like mm. musical kind of stuff. But my essence of who I am is a, a fool, a clown, you know, <laughs> mm. a crazy guy, right? Yeah, yeah. And I got that because in elementary, I'm going to get to this picture. I'm gonna no, get no, 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 yeah, don't worry. But in elementary, I would see people who were sad or melancholy, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't laugh at my jokes. They Or they tended to be like, kind of like I would get the class laughing, and then they wouldn't be really laughing, and I'll be like, who who you think you are not laughing at my shit? So I wouldn't bully them, but I would work at trying to get them to laugh. So I actually ended up making friends with the strangest of people growing up, or or being cool with them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to this day, I'm hella intrigued or interested by people who are totally different than everybody else, who have different yeah. opinions, different. Even if even if I'm against everything they say, I believe in. You know, I think it was Aristotle who says it's the mark of an intelligent mind to be able to entertain an idea without accepting mm -hmm. it. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, I could have conversations with them like that black dude who talks to the Klan. Yeah. I'm not saying I agree with it, but that's, I understand. You yeah, feel me? That's yeah, that's. And so I was supposed to win funniest person eighth grade. Right. At Aptis. Right. And when we were doing the tallies, I was fucking around and writing my name hella times. My class happened to be counting it. And uh -huh. my teacher found it. My teacher already hated me. And she disqualified me. Right? Uh -huh. And she hated me. And then when I got into Lowell, she, I remember she asked me, so what school did you get into, Larry? 
And I said, oh, I'm going to law. She's, <laughs> and she looked at me. This is how deep racism is. Yeah, though, right? yeah. She was like, you're lying in front of everybody, right? I'm like, no, I'm no. not. You did not. You, it is impossible. Wow. And, she, and I was like, I'll bring the paper tomorrow if you don't believe me. She's like, please do, because I do not believe you. You're in you, and I know you're a liar. You know what I mean? She was just oh, like dogging me. Yeah. And I brought the paper, and she was just like jaw drop, like out. And I was like, see, you have a perception of me because I'm the class clown that I'm, and mm -hmm. I'm a fool. And same at the radio station, like my name is Loco, right? Yeah, yeah. And my mom at first didn't like that, right? She was like, I think that's dismissive of your intellectual capabilities mm -hmm. because once you call someone crazy, it's it's like it like kind of like you're just like Dave Chappelle said it. You're just like kind of exactly. like wiping everything about them off. They're just someone who's crazy. There's yeah. not a spectrum of personality or aspects to who they are. You feel me? Mm -hmm. But that's that's another story. So <laughs> so when I got to Lowell, I um, was like the only dude who I felt like was black in a lot of my classes. Um, I didn't relate to a lot of people. I felt like educationally. I could hang, right? I, I didn't feel like I was left out. But, like, I don't know, just being, I just felt like I wasn't relating. And a lot of the black or Latino kids were in ghetto ed. Remember ghetto ed? I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And so they weren't <laughs> going through the same thing as me because they didn't have a heavy workload, right? They're, like, playing ghetto video ed. game classes. <laughs> so I'm over oh, here and have hella homework. Oh, bro. <laughs> so, and, you know, it, it, it's true, though. I, I see what you mean. Like, in my, like, when I went, I went from Horseman, Lowell. Um, there were only two Latinos. One, the other cat dropped off and dropped out in ninth grade. So it really just ended up being me. And then a lot of the folks that I met that were <laughs> Latino or black, bro, <laughs> they were like in that program. So it was a trip. It was fun, like being around sports and stuff because you can relate. But then when it came to like taking notes and studying, it's hard to relate. Yeah. So there's, you're right. I didn't even think about that because. I didn't even think about how maybe they perceived me, so to speak. Like, well, is he really who? Which side is he from? He's Latino, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of, like, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of things that people were questioned about me based on my appearance, and I dress hella hood, bro. I don't know about you, man, but I had the baggy jeans. Yeah, I, I remember, I remember fitted. you, bro. I, I remember you. <laughs> I get no fucks. But what about you? You were really involved. I know, like in sports. What was that experience for you? It was fun, man. We won a couple championships, you know what I mean? Like it was like it was it was a great experience. Um, but you know, when I was when I was at the freshman year in high school, I remember after one time after a Lowell dance, we ended up ah <laughs> <laughs> look at you highlighting, bro. Hey, yeah, I, uh buckets. <laughs> and I, uh, but I remember like, you know, after high school dance at Lowell one time. We, me and we, I don't know if you remember Guatemo, right? Me and Guatemo were walking, and that's my god brother. I knew him since I was five years old, right? Really? And yeah, he was in ghetto at at Lowell. <laughs> and so <laughs> we were walking back from a school dance. He must have been fourteen years old, and we see hell of people walking towards SF State, like a, a gang of people, right? Yeah. And because we were coming from the dance at Lowell, we had kind of like had college shirts, so we we're like, "Fuck it, let's like follow them." And we started walking with them. And next thing you know, we end up at all these college parties and had a crazy night. And we got home and we're like, yo, let's do that. And so, like, in high school, I was, like, going to college parties, you know what I mean? Yes. And then, like, eventually it started getting – I started getting into the crime world and the life of, like, living that kind of thug life or whatever. Yeah. And so I got – I wish I would have took more advantage of law and mm. been more – more diligent and, and and cherished it a little bit more so I could have graduated from there. You know what I mean? I feel like my life would have been totally different, but I guess, I guess it, it made me who I am. <laughs> yeah, it has. But, um, you know, right now with all the controversy around racism and Lowell and then the admissions process, like I tell people like, honestly, unfortunately it's nothing new. Yeah. Like we went through it like this was 10, 15 years ago for me. Like we were going through the same motions. The students were like protesting inside the school. Um, but now it probably, str you know, struck a different vein, probably because of social media, you yeah. know, it really kind of blasted the school. I mean, any thoughts on that? Like, are you it's kind of, like, of the times, not even going to. It's the signs of the times. I think yeah. uh, now, like what you said, social media is just so deep in the game that, you know, 
people get exposed, people mm -hmm. get canceled, people are, you know, and people, I also feel like people are more sensitive nowadays in a good and bad ways, right? Yeah. They're sensitive where like, they can't really, everybody gets a golden star, you know, like that, like they can't handle yeah. like too much of that, like emotions and critique. But um, but then also we're more, we're, we stand up for ourselves more. You know what I mean? We're not putting up with any of the racism that's been going on for forever. We're like, yeah. no, we're putting our foot down. This ain't happening. So there's pluses and minuses to it. But have you seen The Social Dilemma, that documentary? I have. Yeah, I know how it can all be manipulated, which is also really scary. Yeah. About it. Um, and mental health is like down the drain right now, you know? So Yeah, mentally, you know, it also doesn't really shape character because we're standing behind our phones or our laptops critiquing instead of really being face to face and looking at people's emotions and not being swayed by it, but taking into account that aspect. That's completely, you know, taken off when you just sent out a tweet and whatnot. Let me talk about mental health and how you've kind of coped. Because, you know, before we went live, you were talking about the the the, the mental game, how you've kind of uh, been able to persevere mentally. And I want to bring this photo up real quick because you mentioned already two people that are important. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's that's Guatemo right there, and that's my dad. So, okay. um, martial arts. Yeah, I, I you know, martial arts has been important in my life because it trained me to be calm. Cause meditation, right? Yeah, the meditation aspect of it. I have been able to be very serene. Like, although there may be a, a storm above the ocean. I'm calm. Like in many situations, many police encounters where I have guns pointed at me, mm -hmm. many other types of situations like that, I've been able to be calm. And you know, the scientists say, or it's, it's, it's proven that if you have a heavy emotional state, it blocks or clouds your frontal lobe or cortex or whatever, mm -hmm. and you can't access logic. And so you can mm -hmm. make this poor decision making that can happen. Mm -hmm. So meditation has helped me be able to remain kind of like focused in crazy chaotic situations and I can I can actually execute and perform better. So along the same line <laughs> and, and this is kind of on topic but off topic the 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 specific type of martial arts that you might have started with is hapkido. I had not heard about it. The mu hapkido is Korean, yeah. So tell me about what's like have you been to Korea? Do you know like what's your your knowledge of Korean being brought up into this type of martial art that I personally had not really known of. And maybe a lot of people don't know. Okay. So I'll start off with this. I've been to Asia, but uh -huh. I haven't been to Korea. I've been, to, I was in Japan, Philippines, and China, but I have mm -hmm. not been to Korea. Uh -huh. um, I would say this, my dad's the guy who taught my dad, grandmaster, mm -hmm. Jay, he was in the Bruce Lee movie game of death. And he fights Bruce Lee. No, you know, one of the people who fight something like with Kareem Abdul Jabbar is the other one, right? So yeah. my dad's oh. master is like a big kind of dude, right? When you the know game. what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I have pictures of me and like the dude, right? You know, when I was a kid and shit. So my, I would say Hapkido is a, like a mixture of everything. Okay. Anderson Silva in MMA, UFC, he, he does, he knows Hapkido. There's several other people. I think Joe Rogan. But it's like a mixture. It's like Taekwondo is like kicking and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got that. It got, we do groundwork like jujitsu. We do uh, throwing like judo. We do a lot of hand techniques, stuff like that. You know what I mean? So there's, it's a mixture of a bunch of stuff. It's a deadly mm -hmm. art. Like martial stands for deadly, right? So it's, yeah. you could do damage with it. Interesting. Interesting. And then, so you, I mean, you, you're multifaceted. You have all these different um, talents, but you also were involved like in poetry because you say writing is kind of like, that is your forte. Yeah. What can you tell me a little bit about the shout out that you made? Uh, in Ohio? Yeah, so like I was saying earlier, like I would always want to make people who weren't happy laugh, right? Mm. In elementary, and that kind of like developed all through my life. Like people who are sad, I want to make them happy. You know, I've gotten relationships where I've seen a girl crying, 
And I go up to her and make her laugh, whatever. And she ended up being my girlfriend for a period of time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's like what I love to do. I love mm. making people feel better. But who makes me feel better? You feel me? Yeah. Like um, who 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 helps me get through those emotional times when the meditation may not be enough? Mm. Right? Mm. Where you know, you know, a little rasta or a little you know yeah, some yeah, yeah. delicious food or whatever kind of things that could boost my my pleasure sensors you know what 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 can i do yeah and i found solace in writing when i was in elementary i started and poetry and yeah. then in middle school i started rapping yeah yeah what was your rapper name in middle school big chubba because i was fat <laughs> <laughs> yep. what happened to martial arts bro <laughs> It was. I, I mean, yeah, I was still fat though. <laughs> you you ever see Chris Farley's uh, Hollywood Ninja? <laughs> nah. Oh man, I, I I couldn't find a middle school picture. That would have been good. <laughs> yeah, I have one on my Facebook. Oh, you do? Okay. Facebook, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what happened when uh when I uh when I started writing. The funniest thing was I remember Eight Mile came out. I think it was seventh grade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I had already been rapping for a year and writing poetry before that. So I thought I was that. I thought I was the shit, right? Yeah. And then when Amal came out, everybody started trying to rap. And I was like, I was so mad. I was like, fuck y'all, man. Y'all ain't real rappers. You just watched the movie. Y'all y'all on a bandwagon. I'm good about this, you know? <laughs> and um, I remember one of the most uh, uh, impactful moments of my writing Mm -hmm. was one day one of my teachers and if you see if i don't know if you're looking on facebook to find that picture but I'm if you do to, what do you want me to look at is huh what should i look at look for my pictures it's on my pictures uh -huh. yeah i have very few pictures so you'll be able to find it fast let's see let's see but pretty much um my teacher he found one of my journals and he read it and it was all like kill bitches niggas a motherfucking gangster motherfucking drugs like yeah. <laughs> you know i'm like <laughs> It was the music we were listening to too, bro. It's just go to go to Larry's photos. Uh huh. Um, click uh, go down or no? Or, um, click one, click one of those things or or go albums. Go to albums. Go to albums. albums. Yeah, and go to uh mobile or uh, media, 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 media. Yeah, go yeah. down. That one to the left, all the way to the left on that row. Oh, so, yo, I missed this one. <laughs> so you want to see the funniest part about it, bro? So. Uh -huh. It says animation club. You know which one that one, <laughs> right? You know exactly which one that one was. And then hip hop club. You know damn well which one's the hip hop club. <laughs> oh, that's hella funny, bro. That's hella funny. Night and day, right? Like, these cats are trying to smile. Like here, like nah, we gotta be hard. Yep. <laughs> that was you know so. My teacher found and read that. And he looked at me and he was like, do you do this stuff? Is that what you think about women? Uh -huh. uh, what are you, you know, what's, what's going, you know? And I was like, no. And he was like, well, here, how about this? I'm going to challenge you. Mm. This really changed my writing path, my trajectory forever, man. He said, from now on, everything you write has to be something you actually have done or are doing. Ooh. And everything has to be profanity free. Mm, ooh. So Nothing and twins then. Exactly. So <laughs> at that moment, I took I took them into because I, I like totally took it into consideration. I said for sure. From that moment on, everything I wrote didn't have profanity except the occasional nigga. <laughs> but for the most part, <laughs> nothing had profanity and I only rapped about things I really did. So as a child trying to write and I didn't have, ex I had experience because I was, you know, I was an adventurous kid, but mm -hmm. I didn't have, you know, I'm a kid still. I didn't have a life to rap about. So it, it really challenged me to get really abstract with mm -hmm. my writing. Mm -hmm. It helped with my joke writing, which helped with my creativity, which helped with my, my screenplay writing, which helped with everything. Because I had to start thinking like everything I write has to be something I've experienced. And if I can't, if I haven't experienced it, what can I write about? My imagination. And so mm -hmm. I went off into like lemon, blueberry, lime, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how does Youth Speaks uh, play in this story? Were you, did you write uh, under yeah. that program? I, I went, so I, you know, I, I told you this, but it wasn't when we were on live. So I never really had a community because both my parents aren't from here. Mm -hmm. So 
I kind of have that disposition as well where like I love community. I, it's part of me wishes I would have been a part of it, but yeah. also I like being by myself a lot. And I don't mm. like admitting or responsibility where I'm like, okay, I'm a part of this organization now. You know what I mean? I so mean. Even at Lowell, I was always in the library. You know, I was, that's where I spent my, a lot of my time writing, reading. Wow. And so you speaks, so I would go to a lot of the workshops, a lot of the open mics perform seldomly, but I never really got deep into it until I competed when I was like 16 or 17 and I made it to like the semifinals or whatever to go to the HBO brave new voices. And, uh, I didn't make it cause I wrote the poem the day of, and I didn't know too much about performing. Nah. And when you perform and you don't have it memorized, Ooh, your hand yeah. shakes as you read it uncontrollably, no matter what, I wasn't nervous. My hand was just kicking it up. Uh, I'm trying to read my hands like this. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was, it was bad. I didn't pass. I should have did my good poem that I had memorized first. So uh, I didn't to the second round, but I didn't, but at least I made it pretty far. And at that point forward, I was like, okay, I'm going to start competing more. I'm going to start going to, you know, volunteering all the time, going to all the events. And I started um, judging you know, once I became too old to be a part of it, I started judging. I started doing different things. I, I, try, I, I try to do, I'm trying to get a workshop going. I try to do this, you know. Hmm. So that's that's what it was. You Speaks, you know, it was powerful for me because also I was transitioning out of what like, age? huh? Well, what age was this? Like 18, like 18. Okay. okay. I, I was transitioning out of being like, this is when I came back from being out of state, from getting mm -hmm. in trouble with all the criminal activity. So yeah. I was transitioning to trying to find a new identity as a as a man, as as mm -hmm. a as a trying to be still a like not a square or a nerd or nothing against that, but just like still trying to be like an alpha kind of like like yeah, what's up, like kind of dude, yeah. trying to find that identity without trying to be a a, a, a tough guy or whatever. Yeah. Me. I had to I had to find different avenues, right? I found reggae and Bob Marley. He wasn't he was all about peace, love, and having a good time. Yeah. And I found the poetry scene, you know what I mean? And then I found the activist scene, which you know hmm. is that's ultimate, you know, you know, stand Malcolm X, you know, these people who really were like honorable stand-up kind of people. And um, so that's how I was like my journey of finding my identity. And okay, so let me let me go into this. Actually, let me let let you ask a question, and then I'll yeah. go into it. Yeah, oh, I want to I want to bring into so this is something else that you haven't mentioned in the the combo. Like, it's not poetry, <clears throat> you know, it's not uh, ri it's writing in different ways. But this is the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. You know, how did you meet Sana G? How did you get into one hundred six KMEO? Tell us about that story. Okay, so it's kind of connected. It's all connected, right? It's connected yeah. to my comedy story as well. Um, so when I came back from being out of state, one thing I told myself was, if I'm going to pursue this, I have to be intense. Mm. Like I've already experienced college parties. I've already did all that in my life. Yeah. So I'm going to be serious. So I had two jobs. I had two internships. I was going to two schools, one university, one private theater school. I didn't, like, my life was like 100% the grind. Mm -hmm. And um, I was at the Academy of Art University for film. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember one day I was walking to BART because I lived by Balboa Bar. I grew up in, like, in between the Excelsior and Lakeview. Like, Got it. Like yeah, Ingleside, yeah. Ingleside Excelsior kind of outer mission kind of area. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I was walking to Balboa Bar and my neighbor pulled up on me. He was an OG Arab dude who used to hoop a lot. Mm -hmm. And he used to see, we, we used to shoot around every now and then. And he's like, you need a ride? I haven't seen you in a while because I was out of state, right? I just yeah. came back. And I was like, yeah, for sure. I get in the car and he, you know, he was like, you know, what you doing? I was like, I'm going to school. He's like, what you going to school for? And I told him, I was like, but I really want to be a comedian. Mm. And it was like a moment of crazy synchronicities, whatever. He like, he's like, well, that's interesting. My son is the box office guy at the punchline. Oh, no way. Yes, right. Yeah. And I didn't even know what the punchline was, bro. So wow. I was just like, I was just, I just wanted to be a comedian. At Lowell, I almost did the talent show. While you were there too, I was like, I think I was a sophomore. Yeah. I almost did the talent show and did a stand-up routine. I was wow. this close, and and I had a bunch of people who were gonna do it with me, and all, most of them were like, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. So I got cold feet too. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was this close to doing the talent show at Lowell and doing stand-up comedy. So I, I it was always in my mind. 
And um, <clears throat> so after that moment, his son invited me to come and I started going to the local nights on Sundays. And I was like one of the youngest dude in there. I had to get the X's on my hands. You know what I mean? I was like the youngest dude. And in the back. And well, then what punchline SF means for the culture of comedy. Oh, it's is is they ranked it like top 10 comedy clubs in the world. Mm -hmm. in <laughs> it's the world, favorite club. Like Robin Williams would pop up all the time when I was there. Like it was like it's like the it's the real deal. It's you know, San Francisco's arguably one of the greatest cities in the world. So this mm -hmm. is the premier club of San Francisco. Oh, okay. You know. So tell and, me what that experience was like. You were working there, um, seeing some of your idols. Oh man, what did that spark in you? Or what, what it is was it? crazy, bro, because I was like going there as a youngster, and then I got hired as security, and I got to probably smoke with everybody, bro. I smoked with Robin Williams, man. Like <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, and every single comedian, I always asked all of them for advice and no. <laughs> everything so i like smoked as much game as i could what and was I some of that advice that you remember now and huh? what comedian or, or if, you, if you don't want to say the comedian's name but like, what's some of the advice that they gave you like robert williams he told me this he said write everything down mm. no matter what it is write it down mm -hmm. you know and I, I took that to heart i have my notes is crazy bro like people would think i'm insane like how much notes and how many books and how much shit i got like here let me show you let me see. Like this right here. These are all filled, bro. Wow. There's like Just ideas. Like Ryan. 30 God. notebooks packed, like, like to the brim, like no space left. Like writing in circles and in little gaps and everything. Yeah. Let me see if I got one where I could show you how it looks. So you could get an example. I, so do you have so you have a do you, would you say when it comes to your writing and your notebooks do you have a great mental uh, like like uh, memory of where these ideas are or how do you navigate oh. all these thoughts when you want to come back to them? It's crazy. I don't have that, but what I do have is I have sensory rec memory, sensory mm -hmm. recollection. So when mm -hmm. I get back to reading something I wrote, whatever age I was, I remember the emotional state I was in. And what was going on in my life at that time? Even if it's like I wrote blo blueberries, uh, who Larry, who Gary, whatever the hell I write, it can yeah. be gibberish. And if you see how I write, well, that's another thing. When my teacher read my notes in eighth and seventh grade or whatever, I developed a writing style that nobody could read because I never wanted that to happen again. So when I write, it's so sloppy and weird looking that nobody could read it but me. Let me see. <laughs> Give it a shot. Oh, yeah, bro. Yeah, I have to take a picture of it and dissect that, bro. Because <laughs> <laughs> I want nobody to read my stuff. But, yeah, so, at, so while I was at school, right, this is how <laughs> I got into the radio, right? Yeah. So you had to pick. Uh, uh, take a class in a major that or elective, right? That wasn't yours, right? It wasn't your major, something different. And I was like, you know, I wanted to be make music, so I'm gonna do my stuff in radio, right? Mm. And so I did it. Uh, started getting involved with the radio at Academy of Art University, and then I got into the broadcasting, like I did the whole news anchor class. You did. Yeah, I was like, oh, greetings. I took that class, and. Then I had to do an internship to get to graduate. And I said, you know what? I already got the plug in the acting scene, like the TV shows and the movies. Like I kind of was like doing hella extra work in hella movies and TV shows. And so I was like, I kind of got the, my foot in the door. But let me try applying for a radio station. And I applied and Cameo hit me back. Yeah. And uh, shout out to Shay Diddy because she's the one who hired me. And now she's like <laughs> one of the big you know, celebrities on the station. And she like was like, oh, you from the city? I was like, yeah. She was like, I got you. You know what I mean? Like, because hey. so, she's from Frisco too, you know? So I got hired, that? I interned, and Is this yeah. what we're talking about? That Shay did it, yeah. Right here? Yep. Cool, cool, cool. And so I kind of like, you know, I, I wiggled my way. I, after a year of interning, I realized it wasn't for me because, mm. you know, it was, a, it was hard work, bro. 
How so? It was just hard, like not getting paid. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's it. Okay. Like, yo, like this is a lot of time, and I'm broke. Like, you know, and I got a job and two inter another internship and in, in another two two schools I'm going to. Like, it was a lot. Mm-hmm. So I had to step away from it. Yeah. But um, but uh, uh, years later. Cause I, I ended up being a bouncer, right? I got fired actually from the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> Did you smoke too much? <laughs> yes, I got fired for smoking with on duty. <laughs> there, was, there was more to it, but I'm not gonna go into it. Let's but keep, let's say, I want to perform there, so I'm not gonna say nothing. You know what I mean? <laughs> let's just say you already know what happens, you know. But um, but uh, so. I ended up being a bouncer at Slim's, Great American Music Hall, The Chapel, all these music venues. Yeah, yeah. I got to see all types of music, dude. And after I graduated from the theater school and Academy of Arts, I said, you know what? Like, I want to, I don't feel like I'm done learning. Like, because, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, we're, we're law kids. Like, you know, I have yeah. a hunger for knowledge. And I had the plug to get free classes at City College. Oh, so. Okay. I ended up going for the next four years while I was working as a bouncer and stuff and still yeah. interning at the theater, uh, another theater. I um, uh, I went to City College and took classes, everything from science to teaching myself how to play like four or five instruments to Tai Chi classes, philosophy, ocean, you know what I mean? I wow. took everything, dude. I got an ethnic yeah. studies certificate in Pacific Islander studies. Like I should have got a music certificate, but they didn't have the uh, program for it or AA program for music. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's complex, but they I should have. I had enough to do it. But I um I took everything, bro. I, I one semester at City College, I did eight classes, bro. Wow. Like I was like just nerded and out. You were working and you were doing side stuff. And I was by then I started doing stand up. Once I got fired at the punchline, I was like, it's time for me to do stand up. I'm coming back. Yes. And it was I I I did my first stand-up set at the San Jose Improv, the big club. Mm. And it was because I took a stand-up comedy class. And I started doing that. And and so the in, the improv theater, I interned at. And now that I'm I'm one of the main stage company members, I'm, I work there. But I, when I was when I was youngster, the reason I got into improv is kind of like sketch comedy, right? Um, is because that's the San Jose Improv. The one I'm the one I work at though is called Bats Improv. Oh, Bats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, for sure. So the way I got into that is one night after when I was a youngster, when I was 18, at the at leaving the punchline, I ran into one of the comedians. He's a Latino cat, right, um, on BART. And I was like, yo, man, I really want to be a comedian. I want to get better. I want to get funnier. What should I do? And he said, do improv. And, like, he got on the train. The doors closed. And, like, he, like, dipped off into the night. You know what I mean? And I was like, okay, improv. And that's when I found Bats and started taking classes there. So... When you say you take classes, so you 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 sign up for a class. You're it's like a how many weeks? It's, how like, many a, it's like a six week workshop. Huh? What is it? What what goes into learning how to do improv? Um, it's like In a nutshell, maybe. It's being present, uh-huh. being free of all preconceived it's like being is honestly being like an animal like my spirituality is a lot based off of like what the shamans say in the amazon jungle mm-hmm. they say if you want to know the meaning to life or how to live life mm-hmm. study and look to the animals right because that's what we are right so it's like simple it's like life we comp we complicate it so much but really life is like you eat you have sex you 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 survive you you, you you're with your family with your friends you have fun like you know what i mean that's mm-hmm. life and like so Improv is really just being completely present. And I think with phones and all these distractions and people definitely don't meditate. So I think nowadays the amount of presence Mm -hmm. in people's lives is just not there, especially with the youth. Like, and I'm not saying this as an opinion, I'm saying this from the documentaries, from the studies, like we've interviewed people on the radio, like talking about how suicide has gone up, all these different things have gone up. And Mm -hmm. a lot of it is attributed to technology, you know? but yeah, that's what that's what improv did for me, and um, you know, acting was actually what changed my life the most. Yeah, the theater school I went to is the it's called the Miser Technique Studio. Exactly, um, Jim Jarrett. That dude freaking changed my life, man. He made wow. me a better human being. Who is Jim Jarrett? 
He is his like intense as he, sh- he should have been a sports coach because that's how he t- takes the class, right? He's uh-huh. like making people cry and like, you're not mad enough or you you can't do it. Like he's like Ro- Gordon Ramsay and stuff, but he's like a very beautiful, kind soul at the same time. This gentleman you know? right here. Yeah, I love that dude, man. He changed uh-huh. my life. He made me a better human being. That's the best way I could put it. Like, wow. when you act, you have to like put yourself in everybody else's shoes. So you have to be compassionate. You have to be understanding. You have to be patient. You never know what anybody's going through. So you mm. can't make those judgments, right? No matter, someone could come up to me and nigger, and I'm going to be all like, have a blessed day. I'm, I don't got time for your energy to interact. My destiny's bigger than any of that. So yeah. that's part of it. But I'm like, I don't know what people have been through, right? So I'm not going to take go out of my path to deal with what you got going on. You know what I mean? But he made me understand that, you know, life is so much deeper than everything that I've been conditioned to believe. Life is bigger. Mm. Also, mm. taking mushrooms did that for me, too. Good. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking mushrooms, too. <laughs> that, right? like, it's like refocus. But, yeah. Um, that- I, I've, you know, I just, uh, I, I took one acting class in college, and, man, it broke me down. Like, it is probably one of the most difficult things to do to put yourself in someone else's shoes and be vulnerable and be present and be someone else. Um, I said, I can't, there's no way I can even think about doing it. Maybe I will. But my point is like, kudos to you for going through this program. What was it like for you? It was a super intense, man. It was two years. Like we're bad. You're at your own pace, right? You you sign up for the classes when you sign up for the classes. And I TA'd a bunch of classes, did everything over. It's friendly. It's bubbly. You know what I mean? It's like it's a bunch of fun people trying to have, you know, or people who are trying to find the fun in their lives. Uh-huh. Um, with the acting school, it was like it was based more on film. So it was like, you know, shooting and this. But, uh, but this. <laughs> <laughs> you dug deep. It was so deep, dude. You had to confront yeah. all your fears. You had to confront all your passions. You had to, mm-hmm. it was like it's intense. Like there was, you had no life, bro. Like my 20s, I have no regrets in my 20s, right? Yeah. But I pretty much, like, my all I remember in my 20s is grinding, right? You know, I yeah. just turned 30. Like my, my 20s was just like grind, grind, grind. And Meisner Technique Studio, whoo, it was, it's not, for, by the end, there's very few people who are going to make it to the end because it's super difficult. It's so worth it, though. I recommend it to anybody, even if you're not trying to be an actor. Yeah. It will make you a better human being just to understand. Like, that's, you know, I have a big issue with polarization and the left mm-hmm. and the right. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see it that way. I see mm-hmm. it this is the same thing. <laughs> it's like all, like, first of all, this should be, your land, Rodrigo. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is should be Latino Native American land, mm-hmm. right? Because it is, right? Yeah. It's, you know, ancestrally. So for me, it's like all trivial, all this stuff. And, you know, everybody's fighting. Everybody's clashing. Everybody's disagreeing. It's like there's no time for, you know what I mean? Well, you shouldn't give anybody who's a Trump supporter any leeway. It's like, that's a human, dude. Like, what? Yeah. We're going to get to a point where we're killing each other and we hate each other? Like... Nah, man, I'm not, I don't, I'm a revolutionary, but my shit is extreme. Like the low situation, right? Mm -hmm. So the lottery, you saw that new lottery? No, I haven't seen the new lottery. Like I know they're trying to get rid of it. Exactly. So Mm -hmm. they're trying to make it so that more people have access to it. And I disagree with that. And that's like, that's something that most people are going to be like, oh, you're, and it's like, no, it's not. I'm like, why do, why is us, why are black people and why are Latino people still trying to be a part of organizations that don't want us? Mm-hmm. What? I, they are clearly, ha- there's a backlash clearly there. Yeah. Yeah. Why do I want to fight my way into somewhere where they don't want me? No, right. Right. I don't. Oh, you don't want me there? Cool. We're going to create our own law for Latinos. We're going to create our own law for blacks. And we're going to make that the dope school. You know what I mean? Exactly. We're going to do our own thing. That's how I view a lot of stuff. Like, like I'm not against segregation at all. Mm-hmm. We're already segregated. You go to the exactly. mission, that's the Latinos. You go to hey, HP, that's the blacks. You go to Castro, that's the gays. You go to the Hay Street, that's the hippies. You go to the Marina, that's the yuppie white people. It's like we're already segregated. So like all this mm-hmm. illusion of inclusion, like it is, I don't necessarily agree with it. I'm not saying we should be separated where we're like against each other. I'm just saying like 
I honestly believe that black people need a different education. The mm -hmm. education and Latinos too is like the education we get in schools is Eurocentric. It's like European to the max. Exactly. Like I wish I would have learned and been woke at, like you said, where I was I woke at a young age? No, my mom's mm -hmm. not from this country. She didn't even really, <laughs> she's right. like, you know, she's totally different culture. My dad is like, comes from like a hard, he picked cotton, dude. My dad comes from just hardworking, backbreaking black people, like just put into work, work hard. That's like my dad's attitude, right? Yeah. So like, I, I think we need separate education. You feel me? Like you, you get, you learn your black African history. You learn all the history you need to learn that will acclimate you and prepare you for the world of anti-blackness, mm -hmm. for the world of racism, for the world of how things work. I, the low, everybody's, and, and I haven't said that because I know people are going to be so polarized about it. So, well, half of the side is going to be like, oh, you're, you don't understand it's, you're the black people into this and we haven't had the same opportunities. I do understand that. It's just I don't want to go places where I'm not wanted. What the hell? You know, yeah. I went to law. I know exactly how it felt. You know, is what, what people want to go experience that shit? No. Yeah. I wonder if um, if that was lifted the the lottery and if there were more latinos and blacks would it feel like that's the thing we don't know right because our experience and this is where where I'm, I'm torn between should there be a lottery or not and the only reason i'm saying there should not be is because there's one cat and he he loves lowell right he's an older cat jewish and I, when I went to get, I was part of a panel because there was racism three years ago. Low, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, he was raving about it hard. And I'm like, I'm here to tell you how much it sucked and how y'all got to change it. But he was like, no, no, no. And I'm like, well, tell me when you graduated. He's like, yo, I graduated. I was here in the 70s. I'm like, so what happened in the 70s that was so great about low? It's like, oh, what happened was um, affirmative action, basically. And so there was like 20% of the population of, at Lowell was black and like 10, 15 was Latino. And so it really created a great experience for him and his like four or five years because there was all these like different ethnicities. Yeah. So maybe, maybe if there is more, we would have the experiences that he had. I don't know. Maybe. Again, we don't know this because we, we were in, we were, and I personally did not enjoy it my time at Lowell either. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not advocating for it, but I'm wondering what would happen if. So I agree with you. And one of the other things though, is I am a firm believer in diligence, mm -hmm. right? Whoever, and I also believe in affirmative action, right? It's, it's so complex, right? Because it I'm like, is. I'm like if, like, if it had it my way, I would have segregation again. And not in a racist way, yeah, but in a way like where it's like, like I explained earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Because I do believe that if you are more qualified, you should get the, you should get privileges. Or if you put more work in, mm -hmm. you should get privileges for your work. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a hundred percent. There's some people who put hard work, make scientific discoveries, do crazy things. I believe they deserve recognition for that. But at the same time, some people get put into a position where they have access to make those things, right? And, and that's where it gets tricky, where I'm like, yes, we do need a little affirmative action. We need this kind of stuff. But why, rather than do that, why don't we just go to our own special schools? Why don't we just do our, our shit? You know what I mean? True. True. And I know uh, Tongo went to a school like uh, Tongo Eisen Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Went to elementary school that was Afrocentric, you know, and, and, and it shaped who he is today. Definitely. Uh, I love Tongo. Schools, you know what I mean? That really prepare someone to, to be who they want to be yeah. you know, in the future. But speaking about spaces and like learning in certain spaces where it's comfortable for, for certain folks, this space right here, I want to talk about real quick. How did it form? Because like this was a, a a space of knowledge, of sharing, of love, of laughter, of crying. So break it down for me. It was kind of me like pestering a crypto, <laughs> 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 like over and over. Like he, you know, and I owe a lot of my position in life today to him. You know, he's mm -hmm. really he's been a great mentor, someone who's really looked out for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so. 
he had also people tell him when in his youth, like you should do a week weekly show. Mm. Right. And so it got to a point where I was asking him and he kind of like was like, all right, let's see, well, let's do it. Right. And I was like, I'll set it up. Like I'll get, I'll book everybody. I'll do everything. But I just kind of wanted to have like a, like a Frisco Renaissance. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? That's and this was the jump start. This was at the punchline. This this flyer was the jump start oh. into ETC. It was it was also my coming out show. Like mm. because I had been in comedy at that point for over five years, like on stage. I've been in the game for nine years at that yeah. point, right? Because I was like 18 when I first started doing it, but on stage for five years, like I did all the, I paid my dues. I did everything I needed to do to be a comedian. A lot of times people be like, I'm a comedian, I'm a poet or whatever. They ain't paid their dues, right? Yeah, and so I paid my dues and I was like, I'm gonna throw a big ass show. And, and for the first time, tell everybody I'm a comedian, invite hella people. And from that show, my strategy was like, I'm a piggy board or piggy board, jump, a uh, diving board, piggyback, uh, trampoline, whatever into etc the weekly right so do a throw the big show and then say yo we're gonna start doing a weekly thing just like this and i and I, I do so many things right i do the poetry i do the this i do the that i was like i wanted to get it all in one show have artists have dancers have cooks and, and support the people it was all of that man it was and it, you know it's all of that and more um here i just got a comment real quick from rafael picasso he says he's funny as hell until brother Daryl Rogers gets at him. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Daryl Rogers? Hey, OG revolutionary. And you know, with and with all as a comedian, you have to be humble because you're yeah. you get embarrassed, you get made fun of, you get roasted, you get insulted, whatever, right? Yeah. So um I love it. I love failing and losing and I call it learning. But um, yeah, so me and Daryl Rogers used to get in a lot of roast battles. We used, we did a two week march for justice for Black and Brown unity from San Francisco to Sacramento, and on the march, one of the nights, you know, we'd be you know finding ways to kill time. One of the nights, um, me and Daryl ended up getting a roast battle, which then in turn turned into a freestyle battle because I was like freestyle rapping the whole walk. And yeah. so we ended up doing that. I'm gonna post it. I'm gonna post it these upcoming weeks. Hey, was that was that the homie that when I went to to Black and Brown? Yeah, the OG <laughs> black dude. <laughs> <laughs> the black Freddy Krueger, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so bad, bro. I love that OG man. And I love Rafael. Uh, you know Rafa. Hey, that's the that's the homie, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He and feel you know, a lot of it. <laughs> um, you know, you speaking of kind of like your activism, a uh, you know you've been really involved, and this is you know. Speaking of your community, you've built this uh, community in San Francisco around the punchline, around cops, comedy club. But tell me about what was happening here and how you were involved and how you felt about it. Man, you know, comedy, a lot of people saying cancel culture is like, ruining comedy i don't mm. think so i mm. think as comedians we have to have certain sensibilities to the times mm. right so back in the day white folks used to put on blackface and do menstrual shows and that was hilarious to them <laughs> whatever they used to do right yeah now they can't do that right you know, I, and I don't, mm. there might be people who are mad about it, right? But for the most part, I don't think there's white people going, I want to wear a blackface. This is horrible. It's ruining comedy. Like, oh, no. Man. So we have to be understanding about the role of comedy and how important mm. laughter is in our lives. Laughter is good, is scientifically good for your health. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Dave Chappelle, I, like, I, I was like getting little audio clips from him, right? When the whole, with the news and everything was there, right? And one of the clips I got was he says, we're in a time where we need a laugh, all of us, no matter who you are, together, we need it. We need comedy. Yeah. And, you know, like I said earlier, I think, you know, people have lost the ability to, enter like Aristotle, the entertain an idea without becoming emotional or accepting it. Like, mm -hmm. a joke is a joke. Sometimes people take it too far, but if you can't, you can't be offended by everything because then that means people have control over your emotions all the time. 
Facts. You know what I mean? Like, are you going to run around your life and everybody's just like freaking like altering your your state of being? That mm. wouldn't be a good life to live. I, if that was the case, I would be always mad because of all the racism and injustice that right. goes on. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. yep. So comedy for me, saving the punchline was deeper than that. It was it was trying to make a statement of how important comedy is for us as human beings. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and historically, you know, it was shunned upon for women to get into comedy. And I'm happy the women empowerment movement's been going on. I fully supported feminism, all that. And now women are getting more into comedy and fighting back and saying men aren't funny and women are funny, you know, and that's yeah. a good thing, right? Cause now we yeah. have a whole new group of people who were originally outcasted or told not to do that. Now getting into comedy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, a whole set of experiences, different outlook in life. Yeah. The funniness in that outlook is great. Yeah. And you know, I want everybody to feel like they have justice in a fair life and be happy no matter who you are, LGBTQ, I don't care who you are. I want everybody to feel that. And the reason is because then I'll be able to roast everybody. <laughs> because right now, <laughs> yeah, you can't yeah, roast them right or whatever, that. right? Be oh, that's not, you can't roast. Uh -huh. And sometimes I can't even roast Latinos because people don't look at me as a Latino, right? So, ah, so, so they feel some type of way. They'll be like, oh, and I'll be like, dude, like, you should you know see my family. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's like, you can't even, you, it's like getting to a point where it's like, like, what can we talk about? But, I want everybody to feel safe and feel respected. So when that happens, then I can really start digging into these jokes. You know what I mean? So a lot of it has activism is hand in hand with comedy, bro. It's like, it's a part of making people feel like they, they're living a, a good, good life with, 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 with the human rights. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Let's talk about yes. Yes. Universe. How did that come to be? Tell me about it. What is it about? What's what, Man, you know, it's um it's a lot of things, dude. Like originally, um I was gonna do it just just to have another kind of avenue in the radio station and take advantage of it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you know, because I do a lot of different things at KMEO, right? Mm -hmm. When I came back, right, after the years of working as a bouncer at the at the clubs, I came finally came back. And so I do a lot of different shows, do a lot of, wear different hats. And I was like, man, I got an opportunity to do a podcast through them. Why not? You know what right. I mean? Like, why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I take advantage of this? You know, anything can happen. I can get fired. I can move. I can get a big opportunity. I should I should do it now. And so I actually had a, a, a friend of mine, and I really respect what she does and everything about her. And she was interested in getting into that kind of world, too. And so it was just like the timing was everything. And Boom. And so we had an opportunity to interview some pretty dope people, you know? Yeah. And, you know, COVID kind of postponed it and kind of stopped mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm still trying to, like, find ways to wiggle it back in and do things with it. But um, you get a, you get to know a little bit more about me when you watch it, stuff like that. But cool. really, I'm just a frog on a log, man. I'm a lizard on a rock. I'm a koala bear on a leather chair. I'm not yeah. – I'm. we're all – at the same level, we're all human beings. We're all equal spiritually. You know what I mean? So I just want to make the world a better place. And I realize that what I'm good at is art and creativity and mm. imagination. And that could be my contribution. Mm. What would you tell your your 15-year-old self now? Yo, like, I would like, tell my 15-year-old self to, to not leave Lowell. <laughs> to <laughs> graduate from Lowell. Uh, uh -huh. Um, uh, I would say be more rather than trying to be a player mm -hmm. and trying to have sex with as many women as I could, mm -hmm. um, be more, be more, it wasn't like I was out there just dogging women, you know what I mean? But be more like specific on the energy you want into your life. Mm. So mm. that's what I would tell my, my younger self for sure. For show, I know what you mean. I'm gonna I'm end with this. I asked everyone same three questions in San Francisco or in the Bay. What is your one of your favorite restaurants? Um, well, I live literally like two blocks away from Mission in Geneva, or like a little more than two blocks. So I will say that all down my hood, right over there in Excelsior. Uh -huh. 
is cracking. You know what I mean? Right there, you know, El Farlito right there. On, uh, uh, what is it? Miramar? Or, I forgot. It's 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 one of those streets. I, you know, it's funny. I know the whole city, like the back of my hand. No GPS. I could drive anywhere, but uh -huh. not by street names, <laughs> by landmarks. I'm like, where's it by? Okay, I can take you there. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> right. That yeah, yeah, that's it. The one across the street, Guadalajara. Yeah, that yep. one's smacking too. And the the thing I like about both of them, they're open like. They're not 24 hours, but they're damn near. Like, it's like yeah. 4 a.m. Yeah. And it's also my people. I love supporting my people, you know. Um, yeah, that's what's, my uh, What's your favorite park in San Francisco? Oh, the park right next to my house. Which I live is? right across the street. Now people are going to know where I live. <laughs> I live right across the street from Cayuga Park. Cayuga Park. I yeah. Have I been there? Yeah, it's it's considered one of the most beautiful parks in San Francisco because this guy, if you see that sculpture, he dedicated his life, and there's like hundreds of sculptures in the park. Oh, that's cool, bro. Yeah. Oh, I I think I've only I, I went on a walk one of or on a bike ride, and I passed yeah. by, but I didn't go inside. All right, cool. I'm gonna check it out. And lastly, uh, what's your favorite street? My favorite street is probably Hate Street. Why? Because of the history of the hippie movement and like just what the culture that San Francisco brings mm -hmm. to the world, you know what I mean? Like, like what we what San Francisco brings to the world is so much culture that it needs. I feel like we don't get the respect that we should. You know what I mean? We do. Maybe it's because we're here that I don't think that, but I think like we deserve much more recognition for our contributions to the world. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? And that's what I want to highlight, bro. Just I want to highlight the folks that are really contributing to that culture or cultures, plural, because we're like a, we're a funny, funky mix of people in the Bay, man. And uh, that's what makes it hyphy. Yeah. And you know, I'll end on this. Yeah. Like I said, trying to be humble, like I could be wrong with everything I say. And I'm willing to be. And I've taken a lot of chances and I said a lot of crazy stuff and I was out of pocket. And so anybody who feels that way about me, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please forgive me. And I'm working to becoming a better person every day. I'm not perfect. And I will continue to work hard and I'm going to rep for my city. Like people don't like either people don't see like what's behind the scenes like. I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to move to L.A. I'm going to wiggle, and I'm going to really go hard for this crafts of mine. And, I, you know, and I'll sacrifice whatever it takes. Like, not like, like bad shit. I'm talking about, like, I'll go, like, you know, I'm celibate, right? I'm not having any romantic relationships. I will not. I don't go to parties. I don't drink. I don't do a lot of different things. I'm, I'll be in solitude. I will be work my ass off. Mm. And I will rep for the city artistically. Also, I'm trying to get like on some Robin Williams level type, you know, he reps for the Bay Hard. Hey. So that's my objective. And that's that's what I'm going to do, man. And I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to be on the Real City Ambassadors because that's an honor right there, man. That's <laughs> Bro, deep. honestly, the you know honor is mine. For me to tell the story and have this collection of stories like yours, <clears throat> like, I'm, I'm, you, I'm blessed. <laughs> yeah man hey it's uh cool it's it's been a crazy life <laughs> I'm following you and i and i and i'm following you and i don't mean it just social media wise i'm following you and whatever you need you know i'm here and i appreciate all the support you've given me man and the neighborhoods in san francisco so we'll just keep pushing keep doing what we do Hell yeah. One love, man. Be blessed. Peace. All right. Peace.